The title of my message is The Test of Faith, God or Money. So Jesus, he always told parables or stories. Before he preached the message, he would share a story. And half of the audience didn't get the story. But it was geared towards his disciples. And so this message actually was geared towards his disciples but there were some Pharisees listening to the story too. I don't know if you're a Pharisee or a disciple this morning or this afternoon. Hopefully you're a disciple. The Pharisees, they were the hypocrites, the religious hypocrites of the day. And we still have religious hypocrites in our day. People that they act holy at church, but then Monday comes, they're, they're not so holy. And so, and we've, we've all have fallen short of God's glory. Thank God for his grace. Amen? Amen. So this is how the story goes. Sherry, uh, not, not Sherry. <laughs> Let me share. All right, so there's this uh, rich landowner, a uh, rich business owner. He's filthy rich. And he, he has to hire a manager to take care of his business. However, the manager is lazy. He doesn't want to work. He, he's not a good manager. Have you ever worked under poor management? Raise your hand. Like, like, how did he become the boss? How does she become the boss? And so this, this manager isn't doing his job, so he's going to get fired. The, the rich owner's like, hey, you're not doing your job. I'm losing lots of money. You've got to give an account. And so the manager's like, oh, no, I'm about to be homeless. What should I do? I, I'm too weak to dig holes, and I'm too proud to beg. Hmm, I know what I'll do. I'll go collect some money from, from the, the, the people that owe, owe money to the rich landowner. So he goes to the first guy, he's like, how much do you owe my master? And he's like, a uh, hundred gallons of olive oil. Okay, how about 50? We'll call it a deal. And he goes up to the next guy. How much do you owe my master? A uh, hundred uh, bushels of wheat. Give me 80. We'll call it a deal. And so the, the rich owner sees what's happening. And he's like, wow, he's finally working. <laughs> and, and he commends this shrewd manager for what he has done. And so that's how the parable ends. So let's go to... Luke 16, verse 8, if we could. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. It is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of life. Here is the lesson, Jesus said. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone or fail they will welcome you to a eternal home if you are faithful in little things you'll be faithful in large ones but if you are dishonest in little things you won't be honest with greater responsibilities and if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth who will trust you with true riches of heaven and if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and they scoffed at him. Let us pray. Father God, help me not to be a Pharisee. Help me to be 
more like you, Jesus. I want to be more generous. I want to be more giving, more loving. And I don't want to make money an idol anymore. Forgive me, God. I want to have you first in all things. And all God's people say? Amen. Amen. The first thing we learn in this parable is this dishonest manager is admired. We read in Luke 16, 8. We could go there. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. The word admire here means to commend, to applaud, or to praise. So the question is, why is he applauding or praising this shrewd manager? See, sometimes people don't change until they hit rock bottom. I've heard once that sometimes people won't change unless the pain is greater than the change. And so this guy is about to lose everything. He's going to be homeless. And he's like, okay, I need to change my ways. I need to get right with God. See, the rich owner is the father. So he repents of his sins. He, he at least does his best to get the money back for the owner. He starts to change for the better. And so the question we have to ask, how does this apply to me? Am I being a good steward of what God has given me? Oh, Pastor Jose, I earned all my money. No, God gave you that job. God gave you your house, your car, your children, everything that you have. Everything, I don't know how much money is in your bank account, but that's God's. It, it really is. God created uh, the dollar bill, like the material to make the dollar bill. He created the, the, the brilliant minds that come up with... Uh, the online banking, God is the owner of it all. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And it all belongs to him. And this is what Jesus is saying in the parable. Luke 16, 8. The children of this world are more shrewd or wise in dealing with the world around them than the children of the light. What is Jesus saying here? See, this, this honest manager... He starts preparing for the future. He knows he's going to lose his job. He's like, okay, I need to find a place to stay. And so Jesus is saying, you know what? We have a place to stay. It's called heaven. And we got to be shrewd like that manager and do whatever we can to get there. And how do we get there? We get there through Jesus, through Christ alone. And we need to do our best to get our friends and family there too. Right? We, we all have loved ones. Listen to me, church. We all have friends, family, co-workers that don't know Jesus. That means they need salvation. They need mercy. They need forgiveness. They need the mercy of God. We learn in this parable, money can be used as a means to save others. We read in Luke 16, 8. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by the means of unrighteous wealth. Underline unrighteous wealth. In my mind, I was like, wait, I thought money was amoral. I didn't think money was like evil. But Jesus is saying money can be evil. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. So that when it fails, money will fail you. How many of you guys know that money can fail you sometimes? <laughs> it fails. And guess what? And you guys know this. You can't take money with you when you die. And they may receive you into eternal dwelling. Talking about friends. His friends here. It, it's, a, it's, it's a parable. And we can't take this too literal. I had a friend. His name is Robert. He's like, yeah, the Bible says uh, use your money to to buy friends. <laughs> the Bible isn't saying use your money to buy friends. But what Jesus is saying, you could use your money to help people find Jesus, to find the Lord. You know that? Our, our money could be used to help bring people to heaven. It's a, it's a, it, money can't save people's souls, 
but you can use your money to help people to come to know Jesus Christ. I mean, how is that so? Like, I've been on mission trips. It takes money to go on mission trips. So sometimes people can go on the mission trip, but they would support me financially so I could go to the mission trip, on the mission trip, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's been times I've asked family members to support me, and they said no. But they had the money, but they didn't want to support me. See, Jesus is saying that we can use our funds to advance the kingdom of God. How are you using your money? Are you using a portion of your funds to advance the kingdom of God? Or is all the money you get just for your bills, for entertainment, for gas? And, and you should use your money for entertainment, gas, uh, food. But should we set a portion of that money aside for God? I just got a new job. I'm, I'm going to be working as a substitute teacher. Pray for me. I, and so I, I, need, I need the money. And so I'm going to be working Monday through Thursday. I need at least Friday off so I can prepare messages for Sunday. But when I get my first paycheck, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it a tenth to, to the church. That's my way of keeping God first. Telling Jesus, thank you for my job. I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for you. See, we are to honor God with the money he's given us. We can't just spend it all on ourselves or we become selfish people. And the, the shrewd manager, at one point in his life, he was a selfish person. And it, he had to hit rock bottom before he started to change. See, the, the word here, mama, means money. Or the, the money, uh, the word for money or wealth, it's interchangeable. It means possessions, property, and the word mamma could mean God. It's money personified. Personified. Have things changed in our world today? Do sometimes people make money an idol? I mean, th there are young people that used to have this saying, uh, money over the B word. I, I can't use that word in church. But it was, a, it was called M-O-P, money over... Like, what? And, but that's the mentality of our world. It's all about the money. How much money are you gonna? How much money do you make? I mean, the dollar bill says, in, "In God we trust." But do we really trust God with our money? Sometimes we don't, huh? I know a lot of young believers. Oh, they trust Jesus with their salvation. Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my my sins. Oh yes, He did. But they don't trust God with their money. They won't give anything to the church. They won't give anything to mission. They, they trust God with their salvation, but they don't trust God with their finances. I don't get it. If you could trust God with your, your salvation, hear me, church, you could trust God with the money he's given you, which really belongs to him. And so Jesus is telling us in this parable that don't make money a God. Don't make money an idol. you got to make a choice one of these days. Is it going to be God? Or are you going to serve God or money? I love what Billy Graham says. Give me five minutes with a person's checkbook and I'll tell you where their heart is. Give me five minutes with your checkbook and I'll tell you where your heart is. Wow. So when you look at your checkbook, does anybody still use a checkbook? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> uses checkbooks anymore. I do. My mom does. So mom, next time you look at your checkbook, <laughs> see, see, did I give anything to advance the kingdom of God that month? Or was it all spent on me? I got an a, a email. Actually, I got a text message from a young person that I baptized a couple years ago. His name is Vincent Ritter. And he sent me a text message. He said, uh, Pastor Jose, can I get you your email? I was like, sure. So I gave him my email. Then I got an email. He's asking me for money. He's a, he's a senior. And and he's getting ready to graduate, so they're raising money for grad night. And my simple nature is like, nah, I don't want to support him. That's my simple nature. But if I say no to him, guess what? I'm going to lose influence on his life. I want to be a, I want to influence um, Ritter. Uh, I'm actually going to go to his graduation. 
And so I donated towards his cause. You know, because I want to be a good influence on him. And I know how it's like when I ask for money and people are like, no, I can't support you, Jose. It, money, how many of you guys know money hurts relationships? It could positively affect a relationship or neg negatively affect a relationship, right? And did you know that Jesus was supported through money? His it cost money to have a ministry, right? He was a full-time preacher. It cost money, like, he didn't always turn uh, loaves into fish, or he didn't always perform miracles to get the food. Sometimes, you know, why did they have a treasure? Because they needed to buy food sometimes. And we read here in Luke 8, 3. And Joanna, wife of Chusa, that's a weird last name, or name, <laughs> Chusa, uh, a steward of Herod, and Susanna, and many others who were ministering to them out of their own means. Another translation says that they were financially supporting Jesus and the disciples. The word means here to be translated possessions, property, or finances. Maybe your, your name was never going to be written in the Bible for the times you've given. But God sees everything that you give. He really does. He notices everything. Luke 21, 1. And you guys have read this a thousand times. Jesus looked up and saw the rich people putting their gifts in the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put two copper coins in. And he said, Truly I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty put in all that she has to live on. So whenever you, you write a check to Hope City Church, whenever you give money in the offering, God sees what you give, and he sees what you don't give. Oh, I know I'm stepping on some toes today. But God sees what you give and what you don't give. And this isn't a plea, oh, give more money in the offering. It's not. This is just God's word. That we got, are we going to serve God or money? Are we going to make money an idol? And in this book, it's called uh, "So You Want to Be Like Christ." And, and I want to invite you to stay afterwards. We're going to go over. We're going to have we have lunch for you. We're going to go over some of the questions that Ben has come up with. Uh, he has a chapter on surrender. And while I was reading that cha chapter, I realized. When it comes to surrender, the hardest thing sometimes is surrender besides certain relationships. Because sometimes if we get in a bad relationship, God will say, oh, you need to break, break up with that guy. I hope Sherry, God doesn't say that to you. <laughs> but, you know, have you ever been in a bad relationship and you felt like God was saying you got to let go of that relationship? So some of the, the hardest things sometimes to give up or surrender is relationships. But you know what else is hard to surrender is finances. Like, God, I surrender my finances to you. I surrender my future to you. I, I surrender my family to you. So the question I have, what do you need to surrender to God? I can't answer that for you, but what do you need to surrender to God? We all need to surrender something to Him. Uh, we were having a, a, meet, a leadership meeting last Sunday, and uh, I, I was talking about how it costs money to have a church. And Van was like, it costs money to have a building. And I go, you know what? Actually, it does cost money to have a building. Uh, it's my dream one day for us to have our own building early at service time. Why? So we can reach more people. I've talked to so many people that said, I'll come to church if it was just a little bit earlier, <laughs> Pastor Jose. But it costs money to support missionaries. It, it costs money to have a worship leader. It costs money to have a, a part-time pastor. I don't, I get paid a stipend every month. That's why I need another job. Church, I used to have a full-time pastor job. It costs money to have toilet paper. How would you like it if you went to the bathroom there was no toilet paper? Oh, sorry, the, the, the offerings were low this month. Use your hand. <laughs> you know? It costs money to have a church. It costs money for food, for flyers. 
for internet. So thank you for everybody that has given to Hope City Church. You are supporting local missions. You're supporting global missions. Because of the portion of your tithes and offerings goes to support missionaries. Don't you want everybody in, throughout the world to hear about Jesus? Don't you? Yeah. Don't you want to have your own don't you want to have your own building someday? Okay. So, you know what breaks my heart every Sunday? We don't have a, a nursery for the kids, a uh, nursery for the babies. We don't. It'll be nice when we get our own church. I want to have a nursery where moms don't have to go outside to feed their children or go to their car to feed their children or the back